Okay. I just want to like slightly disagree on Nomad being an alternative for Kubernetes. I think it's the other way around. I have opinions. Okay, so might as well get started. So uh, my name's Andy Davies. I'm going to talk about Nomad because most people don't seem to know about it. Kubernetes seems to have won the mindshare, but um, I have problems with Kubernetes. I had problems before I used it, and then I used it, and I had more problems. So this is a talk about stuff that I've learned and why I think Nomad is a, a better orchestrator. And even if you don't use it, maybe just be aware that it exists. So I'm going to start with a disclaimer in that while this is about my dislike of Kubernetes and my like of uh, Nomad, it is also about my dislike of complexity. And in this case, um, accidental or non-essential complexity. So required complexity is what you're trying to solve. That's the business problems you're trying to, you're trying to actually provide value for. Non-essential complexity is things that you have to do to fulfill that goal, like fighting with Webpack, which is one of my least favorite pastimes. If ever I want to feel like an idiot, I open up a Webpack config and try and modify it. And then I shut it and go back to normal work. So I don't like non-essential complexity. And as far as I can tell, Kubernetes is deliberate complexity. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's better if you're just using it, but if you have to operate the cluster, that's where things start going wrong. So to, to lighten this up a little bit, um, Two people have tweeted this, one really intelligent person and me. Um, there is nothing wrong specifically with System D. It does everything. But if you don't want it to do everything, you've gained a lot of baggage for the one little feature you want. And like Cindy says, Docker has succeeded because it was really good tech that developers wanted to use. Kubernetes is trying to be everything to everyone, and that brings a lot of stuff you might not need. And there's just a lot of extra parts. If you're not using everything, then you're still paying the slight maintenance burden to have all of these things around. So the first thing I want to show is, this is the only architecture diagram I've been able to find for Kubernetes. If someone's got a better one, please let me know. So my point with this is we've got four boxes at the top here. We've got the controller manager, API server, scheduler, and Etsy. I think that's how you pronounce it. Etsy. Isn't that a company? Okay, so Etsy. Um, but that box belies, or, or lies slightly, in that it, it implies that it's just one, one little box, but it's not. You've got to manage another cluster. So we've got what? five, six services that we need to run here and make everything work. And how you deploy that is, well, don't. If you're going to use Kubernetes, please use a cloud service. Get someone to manage the infrastructure for you. Because if you are doing that yourself, you are wasting your company's money. There is like almost no need for you to take on the, the, the maintenance burden of running a Kubernetes cluster. Because if you can offload that to another company, like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or some small company that actually provides all of that management for you, then you're saving your engineers time and they can then work on actual business features and useful things. Whereas if they're spending their full time managing Kubernetes, well, they're probably not going to last very long. But this is in contrast to Nomad's architecture, where we have well, it's a HashiCorp product, so it comes as one binary that does everything. Um, you've got one, which is the CLI, which you can use to interact with your cluster. Then you can launch the binary in server mode, put that in an auto-scale group, have three or five of those, those manage your cluster. And then you can put as many of them as you want in another auto-scale group in client mode, which will actually do all the work. And that client binary supports OpenBSD, Linux, Windows, ARM, um, Mac OS, I think. Yep. I don't have any Mac servers in a data center, so not something I need to worry about. But yeah, it can run on any architecture, and you get the same kind of effect of Kubernetes with taints and constraints. So you can target workloads to specific architectures. 
This is how you run a Nomad agent if you want to run it on your local machine and develop stuff, rather than having to fight with Minikube, um, which I've had the displeasure of using several times. <coughs> and this kind of like sets the tone for the rest of the talk, is how easy it is to run stuff. There's so little to go wrong with a Nomad setup that when something does go wrong, it's usually fairly obvious what's gone wrong. You've run out of disk space, or someone's tweaked your security group, and now suddenly the clients can't talk to the servers. There's very little that actually gets in the way. Feature-wise, this is a rough feature map that I wrote for Kubernetes. As you can see here, it provides health checks, feature gates, secret storage, container management, load balancing, routing, storage orchestrations, service discovery, auto-scaling, rollouts and rollbacks, and everything else that I've forgotten. Which is great if you need all of these features. But they're always going to be running even if you don't use them. Contrast this to Nomad, which more embodies the, the Linux or Unix philosophy of doing one thing well. We have container management and then things that need to be done with it, such as health checking containers, storage to go with the containers, and rollout and rollback kind of uh, deployment strategies. Things like canary releasing or red, or red green, blue green, red black if you're Netflix. And the great thing about this is if you use Nomad and then want to go, oh, I actually need service discovery and I want secret management. You can add those parts in yourself. Obviously, if you pick console and vault, those are HashiCorp products, so you get first-party integration, and it works really well and really smoothly. But if you want to use a different service discovery tool, like it's at the Etsy, I will get that right one day, or any of the other service discovery mechanisms or load balancers, then you can pick your whatever you want. The difference with this is, Although we're adding complexity to our stack by like adding, say, secret management, that's only adding one small part because that's the part we want. Whereas if you've got Kubernetes, you can't switch off any of the features you're not using. So let's say you want to get rid of Kubernetes secrets, because they're not, um, and put your own secret storage in place. I'll get back to that, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> then that's great, and you can put Vault into Kubernetes, and it's got decent support for it. It can embed and work really well. But you can't switch off the old secret management in Kubernetes. So you now have to write a mission controller to make sure people aren't using the old secret management, or just try and keep an eye on all pull requests and hope that people don't use it. So while you're adding complexity to a Nomad stack, you're adding it on a fairly small baseline. Whereas with Kubernetes, you're adding complexity to an already big system, and you're just building on it. And the more stuff you build, the more likely it's to fall over. And this is the best reason for not using Kubernetes. <laughs> Who here likes YAML? Stick your hands up. I won't judge you too hard. There's like three people. I appreciate your honesty, but you're wrong. <laughs> If you want a quick laugh, go to knowyaml.com. It's written by Jeff Hunley. It's got a lot of explanations as to why YAML is a terrible, terrible way of configuring things. Surprisingly, Nomad does not use YAML. You can use JSON or HCL. This is an example of a somewhat minimal uh, API here. So we have a job, which is our unit of deployment. And inside that, we have one group, which contains two Docker containers an application and an Nginx proxy. And there would be some more configuration here, like mapping of ports, and we'll get to that in a minute. When you deploy this into, into a Nomad cluster, say you've got three nodes, and you've got two containers, what it doesn't do is this. It doesn't put, oh, well, I'm going to stick your, your proxy over here, and I'm going to put your application on the other side of the data center, and there's suddenly a lot of latency between your reverse proxy and your application. It'll always keep the whole instance, or each, each instance of a group together on a node. So if we deploy four copies to three nodes, we'll get two nodes with, two cop with one copy each, and one node with two copies. So no random latency in the middle. This is a slightly more complete example. 
So this is just the task itself. So we're going to demo this in a minute, hopefully. And we're going to look at RabbitMQ and how to run that inside uh, Nomad. The first thing to note here is we have a port map section near the top of the screen. These are the ports that we want to expose on the container. But we also now can use the labels that I've given them, so in this case AMQP and UI, later on in the resources segment to say we want them in the network. This means that I don't have to keep repeating the same number throughout my file and then lose the number or type it wrong or change it in one place and forget to update elsewhere. Also in our resources section, I'm allocating 500 megahertz of CPU and 256 megabytes of RAM. This is not enough to run RabbitMQ in production. Do not do this. Put more there. This makes more sense to me than the Kubernetes style of resource management where I can request like 0.1 of a CPU and I still I have to write down and really read to run work out what I'm requesting. I like saying I want 500 megahertz. That makes sense to me. So let's pray to the demo gods. So on my machine, I've got three Nomad nodes running. Uh, they're in virtual machines, so I'm, I'm emulating an actual cluster. And hopefully, let's do this source not machine. Okay, so there's nothing running yet. And somewhere. Is our Nomad UI. Again, nothing showing up. So let's have a look at the RabbitMQ. Uh, yeah, big enough. Um, RabbitMQ file. So the difference is to the one that I had on, st on show earlier is that I've got migration and update uh, stanzas specified. So this means that if this was running in a cluster and I had five nodes and I said update the cluster, if I didn't have this in place, all five containers could be killed at the same time. And if you're trying to do high availability, that, that's not so good. So in this case, I'm saying you're allowed to update one in parallel at a time. This means hopefully my cluster stays stable. We have our task driver here. It's a Docker image. I'm pulling from a local machine or a local Docker registry because I don't trust conference Wi-Fi. Sorry, guys. And I've just remembered I haven't run my host script. That would have been bad. We've got ports mapped here. Um, we've gained two additional ones, which is our clustering ports, discovery and clustering. We'll come back to those in a minute because they are really, really painful. And then we've got some details here about how we do clustering. This doesn't really matter for this presentation, but we're using RabbitMQ plugin, which uses console to find other nodes. Finally, we've got the network resources. And as I mentioned earlier, I come back to these discovery and clustering. So I'm using random port assignment for RabbitMQ and for the UI. This means that if I deploy two copies of RabbitMQ to the same node, they won't both try and register port 80 and one of them explodes because port 80 is already bound. However, I have to specify static um, ports for the discovery and the clustering because because RabbitMQ or Erlang requires that all nodes have the same port used for a clustering protocol. This caused quite a lot of pain as I was trying to find this out. Finally, we've got uh, service registration, which is integration with console, and we'll come back to that later on. So hopefully, yep, everything's pushed to my local machine. So I keep all the containers and everything is running off my local host because I don't trust conference Wi-Fi. Oh, cleat, clear. You know how your typing gets bad when one person's watching you? <laughs> you ever tried with an audience? So, let's do this. Nomad job run, rabbit, rabbit, no, nomad. Now, this worked this morning, so hopefully it's going to work now. Oh, we can see our rabbit job has appeared. We have a task group called cluster. Inside there is one allocation, and if we look into this, you can see that it st received the job, figured out where to put it, downloaded the, the, the Docker image, and started it. Now, hopefully it's actually started. Guess what my admin password is? 
No, not password. Admin, there you go. It's 50% secure. <laughs> we'll come back to that later as well. So you can see here we've got a single RabbitMQ node running now. Now this is not very high availability and I actually don't know what node this is on because it's used an IP address. And I've cleared the screen so I have no idea what node that's on. Doesn't really matter. Uh, node 3 apparently. <coughs> now this is useful but it would be quite nice to actually have a cluster. Which is why I've got this here. So the count property on a group tells how many instances of that group we want to be running. And in this case I'm going to do a three node cluster because I've only got three nomad nodes. If I try to do five, I will get error messages. And I'm going to get the error messages, uh, error messages deliberately later. Before I run this, I can do a plan. The output here is saying that the job for Rabbit, the task group cluster, is going to create two more instances, one in place update, which won't actually do anything. And everything will allocate successfully into the cluster at the moment. you also notice here we've got a job modify index. This gets rid of how many people here, a quick show of hands, use Helm? Keep your hands up if you have problems with Helm. Not oh, everyone still has their hand up, that's a surprise. So I've had issues in my day job with Helm uh, state management where Helm's state gets out of sync with what is actually in the cluster and then it refuses to do anything when you deploy to it. The job modify index gets around this for the, for in the nomad world, so if, we if there was me and another developer and we both made changes to this nomad file, we run our plan, we'll both get different job modify indexes back. If he, another developer, runs their plan first and then when I apply mine with the check index of 51, my index will have changed for the next time I ran that, that plan, so it will fail to run. I hope that makes sense. So it's a way of preventing clashing updates. So now that I've done that, I'm going to run it, and I'm going to keep the... Well, actually, let's do a bad check index and see what happens. But let's say that my original check index was 34. Someone else has run it. So someone else has already done it, and the job modify index was 51. So because our check indexes don't matter, my update fails. At which point, I can go and find whoever's been doing the update, get whatever they've done, and then merge their changes into my branch, rather than just you know, overwriting their changes. So let's put the right check index in. There we are. Three of them have now been run, two more created, and one modified node. So we go back to here. That's still running. And if we go back to our Nomad cluster, we now have three tasks running. Now, if we wait a few seconds, if we're lucky, three more no two more nodes will appear in here. Or I hammer the F5 key in panic. Okay, that's a good sign. So they found each other. Now we have a high available uh, RabbitMQ cluster. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Celebration. And if that didn't work, I have no idea what my backup plan was. <laughs> so the idea of this is to put RabbitMQ in a cluster so that we can put a lot of messages through it and then have a number of workers pick up those messages. And we're going to have a look at the consumer side of things now. <coughs> the first problem we'll have is we have, in my case, three Nomad nodes. And I know what their IP addresses are, and I know what their domain names are. Interestingly, not the ones that are up, up here, because I've changed to Linux, so those domains don't work. But anyway, the problem comes when an application wants to connect to RabbitMQ. It needs to know what port it's running on. And I'm using random port assignments because I'm a good person. And as I know my three node addresses, I could essentially iterate all the ports in each nomad, can, each nomad node going, are you RabbitMQ? No. Are you RabbitMQ? No. Ah, success. This one is. That would not be a good way of doing things. And it'd be even worse if I had a very large nomad fleet because now I have to find the right nodes in the first place. Obviously, this is a solved problem. We come back to the service stanzas. Now, I only needed one of these in RabbitMQ because I'm using a plugin, but we can specify a service stanza, and this integrates with console, and in this case, registers RabbitMQ in 
twice, once with the AMQP port, once and tagged as AMQP, and once with the UI port tagged as management and HTTP. We also have a health check with this one, so if this starts to fail, then the container will get rescheduled somewhere else or restarted. Health checks, by the way, don't have to just be TCP checks. You can use HTTP, TCP, gRPC, and shell execute. I don't think I've missed any. Command. Yeah, yeah, commands. So if you want to get a service out of console, you can use curl, or you can use, well, it's still the HTTP API in code, and you'll get something that looks like this back. There's a lot more information that I've cut out because my slides aren't very tall. Um, in this case, we get the service name, what tags it's assigned to, the address of the service, and what port it's mapped to. You can also use the console's DNS interface. So I could just look up rabbitmq.services.console, but I wouldn't get the port back from that. And what happens if you don't want to use console, or you're not? Because while Nomad integrates with console really well, you don't have to use it. It can do clustering and communicate without it. Well, that's fine. You can use Eureka or etcd or etcd or however you want to pronounce it. You can use that. But you're not going to get the first party integration. You'll have to do that in your containers yourself and register your services in and deregister when they get descheduled. Or you could write a Nomad plugin. So let's demo that as well. First demo went well enough, so I see no problems with the second demo. So the first thing we're going to do is have a look at our other Nomad file, which I've forgotten the name of. Consumer, oh, that's logical. So we have a consumer, one group, one task, um, and it's going to run a .NET application. Who here is comfortable with C Sharp? Come on, hands. OK, like two people. Good, excellent. <laughs> So today is going to be a learning experience, at least slightly. So, consumer. So this is not a particularly interesting program. It has a strong type configuration object, because that's something I will also rant about for days. Don't do weak type configuration. Don't read it from YAML files. Um, this is JSON, so it's better. And environment variables. So in this case, we're just using um, the c -sharp console client to read whatever service name you pass in, in this case, rabbitmq, and the amqp tag back. Nothing particularly interesting in that. Um, this also uses the mass transit library, which is an abstraction on top of multiple um, message queuing uh, services. And we're connecting with our super secure username and password and we're writing up a handler to the job message queue. And then we'll just process jobs and take a random amount of time to simulate work actually happening. Again, not particularly interesting. So hopefully I built that. And there's a Nomad file already, so let's do Nomad. I wonder where I put it. Hmm. Yeah, I name. So oh, no, Nomad. OK, it's there. Nomad job run apps. Why did I put it in such a deep path? Good. Right, so we should now be able to go into Nomad and we'll see our consumer is now running. One task. And the great thing about this is I can fetch the logs and look at the information. So we've got CPU and memory utilization. This percentage, by the way, is of the amount of CPU I requested, not of the amount available to the host. So in this case, I've only requested 100 megahertz and 300 meg of RAM, which seems excessive for this. It's a .NET application. It probably needs that much. Now, if we go up to the logs tab, we can see that we've got nothing particularly interesting on standard out, and thankfully, nothing on standard error, which means we've connected successfully. and. Let's make this a larger graph, because it might be interesting in a minute, I hope. So we've got one connection to one of the random RabbitMQ nodes, because I just fetched all three uh, addresses back from console and just picked one at random to connect to. So that's not particularly interesting. Let's give it something to do. I wonder where I put that. Uh, apps. 
bin, yes, dot net, do net, dot net. I have this vague feeling I've forgotten something, so we'll see what that is in a minute. <coughs> no, okay, I haven't forgotten anything. Right, so a thousand items are just being stuffed onto a queue, which should be fairly quick. It is. And if we go back to our... Oh, spoilers. <laughs> if we go back to RabbitMQ, you can see that a lot of messages hit the queue very quickly. <coughs> now, because of my um, application is now consuming those messages, but sleeping for one to five seconds, we're not going to be able to consume these, these very quickly. So let's just scale up our consumer. Five. Not bothering with the, the check plan because, uh, well, hopefully no one else is accessing my cluster. We'll have problems if they are. <laughs> and if we look at the connections, you can now see that there are five connections to this application, and they're all connected. If that's very readable, there we go. They're all connected to different uh, instances of RabbitMQ. And this is consuming messages, but not very quickly. Well, quicker, quicker than it was, at least. So let's see what happens if we try and scale this up too much. Now, my Nomad nodes have only got one gig of RAM each. I could give them more, but I'm stingy. So we get an error message back on this. We've placed some of the allocations, but not all of them. I've requested 15, and three of my nodes have exhausted and nine of those allocations haven't been placed. So that means I have six running, hopefully. And if we go and look here, we can see again, there's a slight speed up. We have six running. And if we go into Nomad, we can have a look at our consumer and say there was a placement failure. Resources were exhausted on three nodes, and it was the memory that was exhausted. So six of them are running. Now, if one of these were to die, that will get replaced, but we'll never actually manage to hit our, our real requested amount of um, placements. Yeah. Right, I think that'll do for consumers. We'll leave that to consume in the background. Now, if we come back to our username and password, this is not admin admin, but it's still not a good username and password. Now, I mentioned earlier secrets. And the thing about secrets is that secrets should be, well, secret. And this is one of my biggest problems with Kubernetes, is because they are not secret. The documentation even tells you they're not secret. They are stored in Etsepti. Therefore, administrators should limit access to Etsepti. That is not secret. That is, like, slightly obscure. They are stored in Base64, and if you've not ever come across Base64, then you could pretend they're secret, but they're not. Please don't use Kubernetes secrets. Have I made this point strong enough yet? It's a bad idea. Luckily, HashiCorp have another product called Vault. Who here uses Vault? Oh, quite a few people. Excellent. And the rest of you, start. <laughs> That's a bit of self-advertisement. I have another talk about how to secure your microservices with Vault which should be online, but not at this conference. <laughs> now, the reason why Vault is great is because it supports both static secrets, so things that you get from third parties like API keys, and dynamic secrets. Now, dynamic secrets are really cool because we can now generate database credentials, or in this case, RabbitMQ credentials, that only have a short lifetime. This means that even if your server gets compromised, the credentials are only going to be valid for 20 minutes, or an hour, or <coughs> however long you've specified. To make this work, we have several options. Well, the first thing to do is authenticate yourself with Vault. Now, Vault itself supports things like uh, AWS IAM, AMI, IAM, IAM, yes. AWS IAM, Azure Active Directory, basically all the cloud providers authentication, as well as GitHub authentication. So a developer on their local machine wants to connect to the dev instance of RabbitMQ, they can use GitHub authentication to authenticate with Vault and then get some tokens back. Once you're authenticated with Vault and you request some information, 
let's say you say, I want to connect to RabbitMQ. Vault will then connect to RabbitMQ itself, generate a username and password for you, store those credentials in Vault, and then return them to you. And you can now do what you want. So in this case, on the left, we've got our Docker container. The Docker container says to Vault, give me some credentials. Vault creates it from Rabbit, and then the container can actually connect to Rabbit using those credentials. We have another option, though, which is rather than putting that complexity in your application, we can put it in Nomad instead. So Nomad has integration with Vault and can manage the tokens and authentication for you. So in your application, again, this is C-sharp. Hopefully, you can read it. <coughs> Ignore the await. Actually, no. How many people here do JavaScript? Oh, only like four people. Wow. OK, never mind. I was expecting a lot more hands. Everyone uses JavaScript. Hmm. So yeah, we're going to fetch some credentials. Um, we're using the RabbitMQ backend, and we want uh, consumer credentials. So in this case, I have multiple roles set up in, in Vault, one for consuming messages and some for publishing messages. Because someone who can consume might not be allowed to write messages, so why give them the permission to do so? Now, while I can do this in the application, it does mean that I need to look after things like refreshing those credentials just before they expire, especially if you're some kind of web server. You don't want to have a request come in, then go and get, talk to Vault to get some credentials, then query the database, and then return those credentials because you finish with them. That adds latency to your, to your throughput, so instead you should have a live set of credentials, and just before they expire, refresh them. So instead, you can do it in Nomad. Now, the template syntax is not the nicest to read, but we can do the same query in a Nomad file, We're saying we want a secret and we want RabbitMQ credentials for a consumer. And in this case, I'm writing the data out into a secret file called config.json, which can only be read by my application. Now, while it's not specified in this particular uh, example on the slide, you can also specify to the application or to Nomad what signal to send the application when it's gained new tokens. So you could do something like restart the application or send it uh, a Unix signal, like SIGHUP or SIGINT1 or something. SIGINT1? I can't remember. This means that your application doesn't need to have the Vault client installed inside the application. And while the Vault client gives you a lot of flexibility, it's again adding complexity, and I don't like the complexity of my applications, especially if the applications are not necessarily written by me. I work on platform teams usually, providing these tools to other developers. And if I can put the complexity of having Vault integration on just my plate, and other developers just need to, in their Nomad files, say, hey, I need RabbitMQ connect connections, and I want it to be in these variables or set as these environment variables, that's all they need to do. They don't need to worry about how to restart the application or how to fetch new tokens. We can push that complexity down into Nomad. <coughs> the other problem, somewhat related to this, is, well, Docker. As far as I'm aware, and I think this might be changing, Kubernetes can only run Docker containers. And now, also other containers? Can you run just random processes these days? So it's improving, but can I just say, run this executable with a Kubernetes cluster? I'm getting shaken heads, so... Mm. So one of my favorite things about Nomad is the fact that I can run anything. So in this case, the exec driver. This is what I used to run my application earlier. I say, run the .NET application and run the consumer DLL, which is stored in the local directory. Where does this consumer DLL come from? Well, I had an artifact source. This is just an HTTP source, although it can be basically anything that can be fetched with, is it go get the library that's used? Yeah, go getter, yeah. So it supports things like S3 and Git and HTTP. In this case, I've just stuffed it onto an HTTP server that's running on my local machine. I package my application into a zip file. When the artifact is downloaded, if it's a, a recognizable archive format, so tar files, gz files, zips, seven zips and such, they will automatically get extracted into this local directory. So I don't even need to worry about 
the content. I can just say, fetch this, and then run it as if it's there. There is a downside to doing this, and that's you lose the isolation you get from a Docker container. But this means that I can migrate applications which I can't put into Docker containers. In previous employment, um, we started to roll out Nomad to Windows servers as well as Linux servers because we had some .NET framework 4. Point something or other. The one that isn't .NET Core. And they had to stay on that version of the framework because they were using WCF, which is horrible in its own right, but that was required. Public API that we, we supported had to stay there. This means that we can't put our application in a container, unless it's a Windows container, which had like 15 gig at which point you've got a Windows server in a box. So there's no point. So we put Nomad onto, onto those existing infrastructure and said, right, our application will pack it up into a, a zip file. It's actually a NuGet package. We just renamed it .zip, problem solved. And then we could just run it like this. And that way we could manage everything with Nomad. It gave us a, a better migration path because the .NET Core applications could just be put into Nomad and run in Docker containers and the existing big application that couldn't, zip file and run on Windows. <coughs> Finally, um, you're not limited to just running services in Nomad. Now, I'm aware that um, Kubernetes also supports cron jobs, but Nomad supports batch jobs and system jobs. Batch jobs are great if you, let's say you run a, an animation company and you want to render a billion frames for your latest movie. Make a batch function that takes in a frame, write them all, and then let Nomad run, a, run all of the uh, scheduling for making sure every frame has been rendered. System jobs run across the entire cluster, once per node. This is really useful if you need to, say, push out a certificate update to uh, the whole cluster, but for whatever reason you don't want to restart your cluster nodes. But you should make them immutable and just do a rolling update of your cluster. Immutable infrastructure is great. The final point I want to make is that while I think Nomad is great and Kubernetes is too complicated, I would also avoid Nomad if I could. <laughs> I know, it's a bit of a weird twist at the end. When asked by my, uh, the DevOps channel in my current company um, what I would recommend for a new project, the answer is nothing. You want as little infrastructure behind your project. If you're doing a demo and you've put it in a container already, chuck it into ETS. Don't bother yourself with managing infrastructure or Kubernetes clusters. You probably don't need it. Keep the stack as simple as you can. If it's not in a container, bake an AMI with Packer. That's, that's what I would try and do most times. Most of my problems come from having to manage large clusters. And while Nomad makes my job much easier than if I was using Kubernetes, I'd rather not have to use that either. I like to keep things simple. Probably too simple, but yeah. It's weird, as a software developer, I want writing code. The more code I write, is the more code I have to support. And the more code I have to support, the less code I can write. So I want to write less code so I can write more code. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but yes, I don't want to have to support infrastructure if I can't, if I don't have to. I want to avoid complexity. I want to make other developers' lives more productive. The downside to Nomad is there are less tooling around it than Kubernetes. As we saw in was it yesterday, one of yesterday's keynotes, the 122 Kubernetes YAML modifying tools. That's great, but that's a lot of tools. Have you got your hand up or are you just waving? Hi. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Can you tell us a little bit about the placement scheduler that you're using in Nomad and how that works? Not really. <laughs> there are multiple placement schedulers. I'm just using the default one. It's not something I've had to look into or worry about. So the question was, what placement scheduler am I using? Am I online? We can go and have a look at the documentation. So by default, it's bin packing, right, for scheduling? Oh, so uh, apparently you can the, use spread now, yeah. the default is bin packing, but you can also use spread. Does that answer the question? Those are words. Uh, the, the, deeper, the, deeper answer. the deeper answer. Um, there might be a guy here that you should ask it instead. Down at the front. A giant purple HashiCorp t-shirt. He should probably be up here, in fairness. 
But that's actually all I wanted to, to, to cover. So now if anyone has any other questions, I have two, let, okay, let's, let's start at the back because people at the front always get picked. Right? See, you're up there. Um, so on your uh, example with the .NET running on uh, Windows, can you go back that real quick for us? Yep. Mm. <coughs> uh, my, my question was, yeah. uh, would you have to install .NET on every single um, machine that you ran Nomad on? Like, uh, would you, like you, Nomad wouldn't know where it was if it accidentally scheduled it somewhere else? Right. So the question is, um, as I'm running .NET in this job, would I need to install .NET on every machine that has a Nomad client on it? And the answer to that is no, thankfully. You can use taints and, oh, I'm not sure if they're actually called taints, taints and constraints. So you can say, this node has these facilities available to it. When you start up, um, actually, let's do this. Uh, F11. Let's make this a lot bigger. Nomad agent dev. So when you start a Nomad client up, Okay, I'm going to draw nice question marks on here instead. Zoom out. Mm, and we'll just stop that now because I don't care anymore. Somewhere in here, <coughs> let's go right back to the beginning. There we go. So the agent has support to detect what facilities the machine already has. So we've got plugins here detected, and somewhere down here there will be outputs from each of those plugins saying what things it actually supports doing. Somewhere. But we can also specify our own. So I can say these nodes support .NET, these ones don't. These ones are Windows, these ones are Linux. So no, you don't have to have it everywhere, thankfully. Okay, uh, there was another couple of questions. Let's go for the front. I'm going to go random, bin packing. So I, I played around with Nomad and wrestled with Kubernetes on-prem, and one of the challenges I had to figure out was how do I expose my services running inside the cluster to the outside world, mm -hmm. which does not have access to uh, service discovery. And one of the, the solutions I had found was to kind of expose uh, the service on each um, node, mm -hmm. and maybe have a poor man load balancing implementation through DNS round robin, which is not ideal, and I kind of tend to look at, I'm, I'm kind of ending up to like maybe BGP is a solution, but I'd rather avoid it. Do you know, like, have you also dealt with this issue, and how would you like recommend solving this? So the question is, how do you uh, go about exposing services outside the cluster, so things like HTTP endpoints, without having to expose all of the cluster internals like console and doing DNS through that. In a high available way. And high, in a high availability manner. I use traffic, yeah. the Docker container. So I have to expose that still, but I just expose that one, and then that manages all of my other containers, which are registered to that, using console integration. You can stick an AWS load balancer in front of it as well. Yeah. So that, that essentially, I try and put one in place and then stick either an AWS load balancer or if you're on-prem, have a couple of machines with, with HaProxy on it. <coughs> it's not quite as smooth as the uh, ingress controllers, but yeah. It's the same challenge. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've only thankfully used uh, Kubernetes where it's not on-prem. <laughs> okay, I think there was one more question. Hi. Uh, what other uh, runtimes are available other than exec and Docker? Uh, Java, uh, so the question is what other runtimes are available? Um, there's exec, Java, Docker, and I'm going to cheat and go to the Nomad uh, project. Let's fire Firefox. I have no browser history in Chrome. It's just that the slides render weirdly in Firefox. Mm. Let's see. Docs, drivers. Those are your ones. So we've got community run plugins, um, which I've never used. I've not used Rocket either. I've used exec, isolated exec, uh, Java and Docker. Uh, I've not used the QMU one, but those are the ones that are inbuilt and you can write plugins as well. 
Okay, any others? It's a bit bright. No, I think that's all. I'll be around in the rest of the conference, um, either wearing this or a blood-stained hoodie, so come up and say hi. Um, but if not, thanks very much for attending.